Hi folks, I'm Barry Nelbuff. I'm one of the faculty members at the School of Management and we are incredibly fortunate today to have Kara Golden with us, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Hint. Uh, when I asked, I, I've asked many of you and uh, what your superpower is when I had a chance to interview you and I asked my daughter. I asked that. my daughter. And what she says her superpower is getting people to drink more water which is true actually for people in her circle. She always has water available and it's encouraging people to drink more. And Kara Golden's superpower is getting the world to drink more water, <laughs> a whole lot more water. Uh, and one of the things that I talk to entrepreneurs about is that in order to be successful, you have to have a great idea. You have to figure out why this great idea is still going to be successful after other people copy you and figure out why it's such a great idea. And you have to figure out why you are the right person to have done this, because most good ideas are a good idea for somebody else. And so uh, in the case of Hint, I think the great idea is, is pretty clear. It's sort of better tasting water. OK, I got that. Uh, you can have it in Blackberry. You can have it in Cherry. You could have water with a little bit of caffeine. You can have water with mint and bubbles. It's all good. Uh, so the question is, uh, I get it, but look, speaking of doubts and doubters, if it's such a good idea, why haven't others, why didn't others do it before you? So maybe that's a good place to start with. Hi, how are you? Good, great to see you. Thanks so much, Barry, for the intro. Uh, so, uh, so why, why hint? Is that, is that the question that we're starting off with? Yeah. Why we, we, what is it that made you think, uh, this was, uh, such a great idea if nobody else had done it before you? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. I, it, I often call myself an ox, accidental entrepreneur because I never thought that I was actually going to become an entrepreneur. And when I, was uh, I was in tech prior to starting Hint, and for uh, for seven years I had been working for a company called America Online and building out their e-commerce and shopping. So truly was was not in the beverage industry, other than the fact that I drank just a ton of diet soda. Diet Coke in particular was my was my thing. And that's when I one day when I had left AOL. I was spending some time with my young kids. I had four kids um, I, when I started Hint, three kids when I left AOL. And what I realized was I had gained a ton of weight over the course of having all of these pregnancies. I had also uh, developed terrible adult acne, which I never even had as a teenager. And my energy levels were super low. So it was really a health issue for me that I was kind of trying to figure out uh, that was was definitely during this period between starting Hint and, and leaving AOL. And so when I gave up my diet soda and started just drinking plain water, that's when I realized that I actually didn't drink enough water. My, um, I was, I found plain water super boring. And so I decided though, to just give up the diet soda because it had so many different ingredients in it that I didn't understand. And when I did that two and a half weeks later, I lost over 20 pounds, 24 pounds in two and a half weeks, which was pretty nutty. And, uh, and my energy levels came back, my acne went away. And that's when I really started realizing that A, I needed to drink more water overall, but B, that what you actually put into your body really makes a difference. And when you're having issues that you can't really figure out, it's often because you're not just, you're not paying attention to what you're putting into your system. And so when I started looking around at the different water options on the shelf, again, purely just a consumer, wasn't even thinking of it as starting a company. What I saw was that there were all these flavored waters out there that also had sweeteners in them. Some had sugar and some had diet sweeteners. I had been really hooked on diet sweeteners. I wasn't even drinking full-fledged Coke. And that's really what had caused me 
you know, what I thought was ca causing me so many problems. And so I didn't want to go into that world, certainly. But one day when I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what tech company I wanted to try and interview with and, and join, that's when I finally just thought, gosh, you know, it just seems like there's this white space out there that really could help not only, you know, me and my family get healthier by making water just taste better, but also it could really change, as you said, Barry, health and, and not just health in America, but I viewed it as health in the world. And so I still didn't even think of this, frankly, as a company. I really thought of it as something I was really passionate and really interested in. I saw this problem and I thought just as an interim step, maybe I could, you know, go and, and start this company. And uh, part of what I shared with Barry a few weeks ago, I launched a book, which is right here called Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. And part of the reason why I wrote this book really was because I felt like there were so many people who, who, thought that entrepreneurs were these, you know, big risk takers and super daring and relentless and that they never had any fears, they never had any doubts, they never had any failures. And certainly that wasn't me and that wasn't many of the entrepreneurs that I've met that instead they were, you know, like me, very curious, um, felt like they had a possible way to solve a problem uh, that they wanted to get out there. And they just thought differently about things that were going on in their existing world in every single category. And so I really wanted to write about this and, and not necessarily what the book doesn't do is give you the one, two, three to go start a company. What it does do is actually share my story and about how without being curious, without just having the ability to just go try and not being terrified of failure, but instead know that that's a possibility that you can actually build a company, which is today the largest non-alcoholic independent beverage company in the U.S. that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi, or Dr. Pepper, Snapple. It's, it, like I said, what you've done is amazing. <laughs> uh, I should tell people, actually, con uh, conflict of interest alert, I am an investor. A happy investor in hints, so I uh, am fully behind what you're up to. We still have that question right at the beginning, though. You've got this, you found a hole in the market, you've got the passion for it, but you know, a hole some you can fall into and never come out of. So, how do you know mm -hmm. if it's an opportunity or uh, a black hole? Uh, and so, what is it that when you said, hmm, okay, why did you, when you, when you said this idea, you said, well, okay. How come Coke and Pepsi aren't doing this? Or when I do it, why won't they just copy me? What? Tell us about that thought process. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's interesting too. I, I probably didn't even reali realize this until I was actually writing the book, but having lived in tech for a good chunk of my early career, what I found in tech was that there's this mindset of, go and build something and go try. And even when you go and launch the, the product or the service, there will be an upgrade or um, 2.0 that comes into play in the not too distant future. And as I always share with people who have not sort of realized that world that goes on, think about the Apple iPhone. I'm sure that they've got two editions that are somebody inside of beyond Tim Cook know that what this product looks like. I mean, there's always these upgrades and sort of once some technology comes into play that is um, a little more advanced, this is what this is what will launch then. In the beverage industry and in the consumer, probably in food and beverage as a whole, basically the theory is let's just launch a product and see how it does. And we don't do anything with it, don't touch it, just throw a lot of gas on the marketing and, and see what happens. And then if the sales start to go down, then we'll reformulate. And very, very different mindset than what a tech company or what, in my case, what a tech entrepreneur was used to kind of dealing with. So for me, I, I felt like 
I never thought that we, I was launching a beverage company from day one. I very, I very much used a beverage as a tool to get myself healthier, right? And to drink more and more water. And so when I looked at the fact that this product wasn't on the shelf in Whole Foods, I saw again that there was a sea of beverages in, in on the on the shelves at Whole Foods, which is supposed to be one of the healthier markets. Um, certainly when we first launched our product in there uh, in 2005, I mean, that was one of the healthier, pro healthier grocery stores out there that I figured if anyone's gonna have a product like this, they should have it and, and it wasn't there. And so I started asking that question and, and you know, really trying to understand a little bit more about how this whole industry works as a whole. And that's when I really realized that there's just a lot of challenges that go on for entrepreneurs. And Barry, you certainly know as well from your experience with Honest, but, you know, it's, there's a lot of, um, you know, you can call it blocking and tackling. I mean, I think that there's a lot of black blocking that goes on by these beverage companies really to kind of protect the mothership in this case around, you know, sugar and sweet. And so one of the stories that I talk about in the book was when I first launched a uh, hint into the market and we were just in the Bay Area and a bunch of San Francisco stores where I live and doing pretty well, frankly, but there were a lot of things that at this point, one year in that I knew that I didn't know, uh, including how to get a bigger shelf life, longer shelf life, how to um, get distribution. And this was things that were basically the stores that we were in that we were in that we were successful in were actually challenging us with these you know things like go find a distribution relationship with one of you know coke pepsi or cisco and i was like do you have their phone number i mean who do i call in order to make this happen so i figured at this point i've got it off the ground maybe somebody would take it over maybe i could partner with one of these big you know, soda companies to get distribution. I don't know. And that's when I ended up reaching out to a, a soda executive, a friend connected me um, with somebody very senior at Coca-Cola. And I ended up having a phone call with him. And, and that's when 15 minutes into the conversation, he said something to me, which uh, was, was really impactful and, and important in so many ways. He said, sweetie, Americans love sweet. This product isn't going anywhere. And I mean, I was sort of shocked because he called me sweetie, number one, but number two, just the fact that um, as, as he, he opened with that statement and all of a sudden I started to listen because I was, couldn't believe he said this to me, but then he went on for the next 45 minutes to tell me why there was no interest in my product that nobody really wanted water. What they wanted was sweeter stuff and that their mission was to really encourage people to, to you know, really look at calorie counts and they wanted to continue to sweeten products, but they were trying to develop um, lower or use lower calorie sweeteners so that they could eventually get down to zero. They were only at 10 calories at that point. And so after that phone call, I really realized that something that was, that was truly the mission of our company, which was that he never mentioned the word health anywhere in this one hour conversation. And every time I described hint to people, I said that this is a product that's going to help people to get healthier and drink water. And or a product like Hint that just uses flavor. And that was really the, the key time when I realized that, that I, I'm not even sure he was on a mission. He was clearly on another river, but, and that is really the, the challenge I think with so many really large companies, again, in every single industry that they're continuing to do what they do because why fix it, right? They're selling products, so why fix it? And large companies aren't great at innovating. They're, they're good at continuing to do what they do. 
the other piece of this is when you're kind of going against the mothership and what they're really trying to encourage people to do, that's where, you know, it's really, it's, it's just a whole different mindset. We were a health mindset from day one. We still are. I think that, you know, the challenge for a lot of these big soda companies is that they have seen the consumer catch up to where I was at, right? It's taken a little longer than maybe I think anybody had predicted, but I think at the end of the day that that's really the key thing. So when, when I, doubted myself when I, you know, worried, I, I think, about whether or not I could ultimately make this company what it is, sort of the last people that I was actually concerned about was really the large soda companies, because I thought that, you know, they're, they're really pushing against what will come naturally, and what people will find really important. And frankly, I think in 2020, um, that has only escalated. I think health is, is a number one priority for everybody in the world. And, uh, and I think that people recognizing what they're putting into their body is super, super important. Thank you. I, I had a similar experience with Indra Nui at Honest Tea in terms of her explaining early on why this product would totally fail. Uh, Real, what, really? What happened? Well, basically, uh, she explained that it wasn't nearly sweet enough. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Interesting. And also the, uh, sorry, I'm blanking his name, the gentleman who founded Sobe uh, came into one of my classes and basically said, I've got a solution for you to make you a billionaire. Take with your product and add sugar. Uh, so they had this uh, constant uh, Johnny One Note view. On the other hand, you know, Perrier uh, thinks about, uh, there, there were a lot of people who did bubbly water with flavors. Uh, LaCroix and Perrier, but nobody had done still water uh, with flavors. And so- yeah, and and what? that's changed too. I mean, there was a version of um, flavor with with bubbles, but when I first came out with Hint, everything had a lot of sodium in it. And so it was moving away from, um, I didn't want to swap out the sweet for the sodium either. Um, so, but today they clearly have moved away from, from that as well. The next question that's connected to this is why you? Uh, and you talked a little bit about being accidental. So you had worked in sales at Time Magazine, at CNN, you had worked on at AOL. Uh, so that's gonna be helpful when you're thinking about D to C. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this notion of you going into the beverage world, uh, where, like I said, you did, as you said, you didn't even have the phone number of the person to call. Yeah. Uh, never mind the, the, the name. So. Uh, help me understand that thought process. So I think uh, the, uh, the key thing, it, when I started my career actually in circulation, um, so at, in the magazine industry and then moved into um, a, a sales and, and strategy role at CNN and then, um, and then ended up working at a startup that was a uh, Steve Jobs idea that was a spin out of Apple where, uh, although I was hired to go in and, and basically build out the shopping partners that we would be working with on our CD, what I found is that I was very involved also in strategy, everything from not only a pricing model um, and actually how to ultimately make money for the product, but also um, how do we service the customer? How do we, you know, think of, you know, things like life cycle marketing and things that we're all talking about still today. AOL ended up acquiring us uh, because of the relationships that we had on this disc. And I ended up coming into AOL and again, sort of reformulating what I had done on this disc to really build out a marketplace that was a billion dollars in revenue. And when I left after seven years at AOL, and like I said, I had you know kids at home, I had stayed at home for a couple of years, I was really looking for what do I do that, that really makes a difference and, and something that I'm super passionate about. And when I stumbled upon this problem that was, you know, right in front of me, but I had just 
basically given up on for years. It just seemed so clear to me when I actually started to see a little bit of light just by actually going and, and drinking water and then finally slicing up fruit in my kitchen and throwing it in the water. And I knew pretty quickly that I was ahead because I would, I would talk to friends, I would talk to family and say, gosh, it was actually pretty easy. Look how big mm -hmm. these, you know, the diet industry is, look how, you know, large these categories like diet sweeteners and this drink called vitamin water was out there. Um, really, you know, getting lots Sounds of traction, healthy, even if it isn't. Right, exactly. There were all these healthy perception products. And I remember sharing with um, with a few people, including uh, this guy, Omid Cortesani, who was at Google, who was trying to hire me to come inside of Google. And, you know, he's like, wait, so what are you doing? You're starting a beverage company. Like, this seems crazy. Come in and work with us at Google. And I said, you know, I feel like there's never a good time. For anything. Look, like I have three kids right now that are under the age of four. There's, uh, you know, I've had this great career. I've always uh, figured out something that, that I wanted to do every single day that I was really passionate about and that satisfied my curiosity. And for whatever reason, health is something that is critically important to me and also for my family to be working on. And and I remember Omid saying to me, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the key thing is being able to get up every single morning and be interested in, in what you're doing. And people would say to me like, gosh, seems really risky. And I never saw it that way because I really believed that if I was doing something that I was really passionate about or that I was really curious about, that I had an idea and like, maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't work. I could always go back to what I had been doing. And I had had this, you know, great career. And so I would say that to people and they would, they were like, well, I guess, but I mean, you're starting a beverage company. Like what, what are you doing? And, and again, it wasn't really that it, it, it just wasn't really the purpose um, or their purpose. I should say for me, I just thought that this was something that could change health in the world, like a major, major thing. But Again, I, I knew early on that I was ahead of the curve. I, I was hearing from con consumers, though, one thing that I talk about, and I know you guys did it at Honest as well, um, Barry, but I, putting our phone number and an email on the bottle, l literally the first day that we had gotten into Whole Foods, we had consumers reaching out to us saying, where have you guys been? I mean this is amazing. This is really helping me to drink water. So I knew there were consumers out there. I just had to find them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was ahead of it. And, and when, even when that guy at Coca-Cola said to me, you know, this is not going anywhere. I'm like, I don't know. Cause this is what I know. It's made me healthy. I know I've got consumers that are telling me, thank you. Right. And, and that's such an important thing. And something that I share with people all the time that I think in, t in tech too, that I was just a little away from the consumer. I was never having consumers. I mean, I was really B2B versus B2C, which is a whole other you know, piece of this. But I think when, you, when you're in a B2C relationship and you've got the consumer sort of cheering you on and giving you energy, there's, there's kind of nothing like it. Right. And yeah. especially when you're solving a problem as important as health. I mean, that's just huge. Uh, to the audience here, if you want to ask questions, uh, one way to do that would be to put things in chat, which I can look at and then perhaps moderate and uh, have questions for Kara coming that way. Uh, it's clear that from your perspective, uh, you ha you were very employable, and the gentleman at Google was likely to hire you two years later, uh, even if this venture didn't work. But on the other hand, it was going to take some money to start Hint. And so there was some risk there in terms of financial. Uh, how costly was it uh, to start this operation? So I had... Uh, it, so I had sort of spec this out when I decided to start 
uh, the company, and I think you will attest to this and, and the beverage industry, it was this whole new language, right? This whole new vocabulary that I didn't even know existed, including things like I always share with friends that once I figured out that this uh, little thing that goes on top of the bottle is not called a cap, it's called a closure, right? And so if you run around saying caps, um, in the beverage industry, you sort of uh, out yourself a little bit that everybody knows you're not really in this industry. So I had some major, major uh, learning to do that I kept asking people, I kept looking for the book that kind of explained this, all of this jargon and, and how to find a distributor, how to get shelf life. And what I realized is that I wasn't going to get it. And I needed to just kind of learn by just asking a ton of questions. And so um, one thing that I've really thought a lot about that I cover in the book too, is that the fact that I didn't have experience in this industry and that I had been a successful executive that they could check out in sort of other industries, I was able to walk in to bottling plants and, you know, basically say, listen, I know nothing about your industry, but if you can't meet me until 10 o'clock at night in order to you know, go over the ins and outs of this industry, I'm here, right? I'm willing to work super hard in order to learn this industry on your time. So that was part of it. Like part of it was time. I think that I was willing to invest that they thought was pretty unique, but, frankly. But there's, but there's money too. I mean, look, the one thing that's a, a great aspect of Hint uh, mm -hmm. and beats honest tea, uh, hands down, is that, you know, we had to put tea in there. We had to put uh, some honey, agave, maple syrup, all of which is expensive. Uh, yeah. And the nice thing about selling water, you can sell it at the same price, and the cost of your ingredients are incredibly low. Uh, and sort of one lemon goes a long way uh, in terms of hint. But nonetheless, there's cost of bottling plants, graphic design, uh, getting this whole thing going. And so I don't know, is it a half a million? It was a million. There's some amount of money it took to start this thing. And that Yeah. So we, so I took $50,000 out of my bank account. Once I had figured out that this was something that I was going to move forward with. And again, I, I, there was a lot of sweat equity just trying to, you know, talk to as many people as possible. But finally, when we decided that we were ultimately going to bottle and we wanted to create our own fruit extracts, um, that was that was really when uh, I needed to put up some money. Um, but it wasn't a half million dollars. It was uh, we worked pretty scrappy. Uh, we I knew a couple of freelancers. I had an idea for what the actual label would look like and it's not too different than than the actual design of this label other than the fact that it was a clear label versus a white label um, but we we've always and and still to this day I would say that it's it's really something that that we kind of pride ourselves on that we've been pretty scrappy about actually putting things together but yeah fifty thousand dollars was the initial run of the product and by the time we bought the bottles and the and the fruit and and got enough that kind of filled up my garage uh, before we ultimately got it on the shelf at at Whole Foods. Daniel uh, asks, "What crucibles shaped you as a leader, and what would you do differently if you could turn back to the beginning of your career?" I think that the thing because I had never been an entrepreneur. I had worked with different entrepreneurs, uh, including, um, I actually didn't work with Steve Jobs, but I worked with people who had worked with Steve Jobs. I never worked directly for Ted Turner, but I worked with people who worked directly for Ted Turner. Lots of different, um, you know, people who I think if you were studying to become an entrepreneur, they would be the perfect people. But again, that wasn't the purpose for me. It was really more the idea. But I think with that, I I felt like somewhere in there that I wasn't um, I wasn't capable. As crazy as that may sound um, today, like I I just felt because I didn't have 
I doubted myself because I didn't have the experience. And even though those people didn't have the experience prior to starting what they started, I, I really started to doubt. And certainly there were plenty of people around me who didn't who didn't help matters by saying, I don't know. I mean, you've had a really successful career and this, and so maybe you should just go back to that. And, and, and so I would say that the key thing was really not believing in myself and not really looking at it instead as, as a puzzle and, and recognizing my own capabilities and, and saying, okay, listen, this may not, happen but if i just go try and i pay close attention and i keep making progress on this that i might be able to do it in the beginning i remember searching around as i was doubting myself for you know the perfect people i i remember not only trying to hire all of these people who had years and years of experience but also I, I, when I was having that phone call with that Coke executive, I mean, I, you know, got a lot of anxiety one week before having that call because I thought, okay, this is really important. He's going to wave his magic wand and solve all of my problems. And that's, that's really when I realized that this is, this is something just like in life that when things are really hard and really important and rewarding enough that if you believe in yourself and and you believe you're resourceful too and and that you're willing to go try that you may be the one who has been gifted this idea to actually ultimately go solve thank you just uh let's do a plug for a second i don't know if this um there was at one point a promotion between the book and hint does that promotion still exist uh we did it as a pre-sale to, pre -sale. to so the it's too book. late now yeah, well, it's, uh, but definitely um, I, we're doing s specials all the time on the okay. hint side, though. Uh, Anu Segal uh, says, I am also a mompreneur. Uh, what advice do you have for moms of younger kids that are thinking of starting their own company? I think that the key thing is to recognize that... <coughs> Sorry, water went down the wrong way. Um, that I, everybody kept saying to me that, oh, you have to hurry, you have to hurry. And what I realized is that being an entrepreneur, um, and I've talked to many entrepreneurs about this, probably the biggest mistakes come when you actually do hurry. And so being a mom, I, I think is, uh, is definitely possible. And maybe you have, um, maybe you, you put a lot less pressure on yourself to just get it all done immediately. And I'll tell you that one of the chapters in my book, I talk about my son, Keenan, who's now 18. When he was 12, he, uh, he was watching Sheryl Sandberg on TV talking about the fact that women are uh, not CEOs of companies and, and obviously lean in and, and some of the other initiatives that Cheryl has spearheaded. And he said to me, mom, I just realized that women aren't CEOs. And I thought, oh, great. Now I have to sit there and have this conversation with my son at the dinner table. And, uh, and he went on to say, but I don't really understand because you've always been a CEO. So I don't really understand why it's not normal and in so many places. And that's really when I realized that what I do at home is not only important for me, and it, it, but also important for my kids to really show them the way that maybe the rest of the world doesn't think it can or should be, but it, being a role model uh, for, for my own kids is really, I think, something that is super valuable to me and something that obviously they're watching. One of our MBA students, Tiffany Leung, is, uh, wants to start a beverage company, and uh, it's called Qi, uh, and it is taking Chinese or uh, her family's uh, recipes. Uh, Tiffany, actually, why don't you unmute yourself, if you can? Uh, is that, can we make that happen? And you can ask your question directly. But Thanks here so much, Gary. <laughs> 
Hi, Kara. I'm such a huge fan. I read your book this weekend and loved oh, it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to launch a beverage company that's bringing East Asian superfoods to the mainstream Western market. And um, I realized that Hint was kind of, you're launching a new product category. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you marketed, you know, this new category to consumers? especially since the beverage um, business or beverage space is pretty competitive and uh, maybe some advice for someone launching a, a beverage with new ingredients today. Okay, just, just. Yeah. So just really clear, important. One is Hawthorne. What's that? I'm going to tell you what her ingredients are. Hawthorne in one case, chrysanthemum in another and jujube is the third. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, so you nailed it. I mean, I think that on the one hand, I, I totally got that I was launching a you know new product and a, a new company, but I was a quick study and and learning that this was also a new category. And I think anytime you launch a new category in any industry, it's it, it, the the net net of this is that you're going to be educating the consumer right? So they're not used to actually seeing what you're offering. And I think in the case of beverage, what I saw too, is that I was also educating buyers. And so when buyers had planograms that basically said water and tea and diet soda and soda, and then maybe these enhanced waters, but they all had sweeteners in them, we didn't fit. And so we couldn't actually go into like Safeway, um, for example, um, because we didn't fit into their planogram. And I thought, and I said, well, just create a new category. I mean, that's what we've done. We created a new category and our buyers all said, that's above my pay grade. We can't actually do that. So I think that the difficulty is, is that when you are coming in, it sounds great that you're creating a new category. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of education, but Oftentimes the, the, the buyers will slow you down to actually, you know, get out into the market. And then the consumers need a lot of education as to why they ultimately need this product. And so I think early on, something I mentioned a few minutes ago, having a, a call to action for the consumer on your bottle and, um, and really trying to figure out how do you connect with that consumer so that they can ultimately not only grow within their community that this product is great is super important 15 years ago social media was just not i mean it, it really wasn't existent um, like it is today so i think that it's in some ways it's easier to go and get those audiences and get them to do some of your um, advocacy work to ultimately educate the, the one thing that I would say that we've learned about uh, unique ingredients is and, and unique flavors, um, just as an example, I remember early on, I grew up in Arizona where hibiscus is a, a pretty common um, flower that's used in lots of teas, definitely kind of Latin America, uh, you know, origins living kind of in the Southwest. So a lot of people in Southern California, as well as Arizona knew what hibiscus was, the rest of the US didn't know what hibiscus was. And so even though that that ingredient was amazing and tasted great, it was really, really difficult to get the consumer to really understand what it was going to taste like. And so if the consumer doesn't know what something's going to taste like, then they won't pull it off the shelf. And so that they, they have this idea in their head what something's going to taste like. And so I think that it's just something to be aware of that the you know ingredients, especially when, when consumers aren't aware of what that is ultimately going to taste like, I think that they just get nervous to actually purchase it. And very, I would guess you would say something similar. We had that exact experience uh, with a uh, red tea. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are two uh, red teas out there. 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, blanking on the uh, ones that uh, it'll come to me. Uh, and when we, uh, Honeybush, uh, mm-hmm. and when we uh, had a Honeybush tea uh, from Harlem, H-A-A-R-L-E-M, South a- uh, Africa, he was like, huh, what is this all about? Uh, mm-hmm. And it died. Uh, but then when we ended up doing a, just a, a plain uh, uh, red tea with other flavors, and red, it, we weren't emphasizing the Honeybush, we ended up selling a whole lot more of it. So mm-hmm. I think you're right that Tiffany uh, is going to have a challenge uh, because nobody's heard, not mainstream has not yet heard of Hawthorne, Jujube, uh, Chrysanthemum, maybe a little bit more. But also tell me how you react to the fact that she has 19 grams of sugar in here and 110 calories. So it started healthy, but then what? Yeah, I mean, I think there's still... Look, I'm all about unsweetened and that's what that's what we do. I I think that there are consumers that are especially if it's um if it's you know not refined sugar and and there's there's things that that people will buy on the market um but I I think that the key thing for a lot of people will probably be trying to figure out exactly what the, you know, what these ingredients are. But I think that there's no better way to, uh, to, to test that than actually just to get it out there on, on the shelf and see in a couple of markets and try and figure out if there's, um, if there are consumers and, and trying to actually talk to consumers um, about that without actually feeding them too much information. I've never been a big believer in focus groups. I've spent tons of money uh, when I was, uh, tons of other people's money when I was in tech, um, getting focus groups together. And what I found and what I always advise entrepreneurs to do is try and figure out how you can actually get it on the shelf in some place and see exactly how consumers respond to something. Uh, we're almost out of time, so let's end on this choice of the word undaunted uh, and why you pick that as the title of your book and uh, w- what it means to you. Yeah, so I really believe that living undaunted is, uh, is really a mindset and a way of life. And so often people will not do things because they feel that they're too risky or they put up walls that really prevent them from actually moving forward or just going out and trying. And I think that if you live undaunted, you live a life that is filled with trying and satisfying your curiosity. And even if you're not that curious of a person, or maybe your curiosity has, you know, stifled over, over the last many, many years, because you felt that you, have to um, kind of live this life uh, that that is is what you have experience doing or you graduated with. Instead, if you go out and actually go out and live undaunted, you're living a life which is, um, I think, much more fruitful and one where you're more interesting. You're you're more willing to kind of take on uh, things that are not necessarily the obvious and uh, and even if you fail, you've got an incredible journey and story and learnings to ultimately um, share with other people. Uh, that's great. Thank you. We're incredibly fortunate that you could spend your morning with us. Kara's out in California. Thank um, you. And uh, for those of you who love Hint, and for those of you who want to try Hint, let me say that I think it's if you get three cases on Hint, uh, drinkhint.com, you get free shipping. Uh, Amazon often has stupidly low prices, uh, even on one case. Uh, and so if you uh, just want to go that way, uh, you might even find a case for 13 or $14, uh, and, uh, or just put it on uh, regular, what is it, uh, subscribe and save, and uh, enjoy it that way as well. Uh, for those of you who are going to take Innovator, uh, that's the first year, you know, uh, where's, besides uh, 
Amazon. Uh, can you get the book on Hint, Drink Hint as well? You can. And uh, I would love to hear from you. I'm all over social at Kara Golden with an I. And uh, I, I would love to hear from all of you. And, and hopefully you guys will get a chance to read the book or also Audible. It's, it's on Audible as well. And uh, I read the book um, as well on, on Audible, so which was a big learning experience and, and lots of fun and, and also living undaunted, <laughs> Ooh, exactly. reading undaunted. <laughs> there we go. Uh, thank you. And uh, we, uh, like I said, the, the world is a better place uh, for people drinking more water and you are the one who's making that happen. So thank you uh, so much. I really appreciate, I appreciate you guys it. having me. Take care, all. Thank you. Goodbye.